Hi, I'm Stephen Barclay, Director of Global Business at Flint Rock Consulting. For over 25 years I've been working with values and how they influence our lives. In this OWL Insight series on working with values, I bring you conversations on values with thought leaders from around the world. Let's dive in for our conversation. Welcome to um, our OWL Insights Working with Values series. Um, and a very warm welcome uh, to Mary uh, Gentili, uh, who's an absolute pioneer in the world of uh, working with values and the creator uh, and director of the Giving Voice to Values program, which has been adopted in about 1,200, probably more now, Mary, um, business schools. Yeah, over 1,400. <laughs> over 1,400. Um, it's all been over, shared or piloted, yeah. <laughs> all over the world. So, Mary, a very warm welcome to you and thanks for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure. It's good to see you again, Stephen. Yeah, great. And and Mary, as as I just said, you you've been working with values for a long time. You're the creator of the Giving to Voice to Values um, program. You've um, you've been involved um, in values from a personal perspective and an organizational perspective and communities. What? How would you define values for yourself? <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, I've been working, as you say, in this field for quite a few decades, and um, values is one of those overdetermined words. In other words, it can be defined in many different ways and is defined in many different ways by different people. So I find that it's important to clarify what I'm talking about when I'm talking about giving voice to values, which is a an approach to values-driven leadership development. So, you know, there are values that are moral values, virtues, ethical values. Um, the research suggests that that those are pretty much universally shared, but it's a short list and it's very high level. But then there's also values that are more um, um, personal, personal values, individual values, uh, cultural values. So for example, you know, there's, there's integrity um, or compassion or justice that sort of falls into that first category of, of widely shared um, um, hyper norms, the philosophers call them. And then there's things like, you know, I like country and you like city or, you know, things of, or that I'm, I'm more uh, comfortable in one-on-one -on -one conversations and individual connections, and maybe you're more comfortable in large groups. And, you know, those are a different kind of values, a different level. And they often get confused when people are trying to work in organizations. And I think one of the most important things is to understand that when we're trying to work around values and organizations, we have to leave a lot of room for people to have that diversity of values, that second type that are more about our personalities and our style and our, our, our cultural backgrounds and things of that nature. And to really try and find the connections and the alignments and the consistencies across that short list of high level, but very important ethical values. Wow, well, thank you. And 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 appreciate what you're saying is, is that giving people the room um, because it's such a diverse list of values. And how, how do organizations manage that interplay? They they may have what they call their organizational values um, and the individual um, values. So how does that interplay uh, carry out in organizations? What, how have you witnessed that? What, what do people do to bring the two together? Right, right. Well, if you actually look at organizational codes of conduct and value statements, mission statements, you know, whatever language they use, statements of purpose is very popular these days. If you actually look at those, and there's people who've done studies of these kinds of statements mm -hmm. across corporations, um, you'll find that that there really is um, a great degree of consistency. You know, there's usually something around treating people with respect. There's usually something around inclusiveness. There's usually something around integrity or honesty. There's usually something around um, performance. Um, and then, you know, there's usually a few values that kind of capture more of the flavor of the organization. So some of the organizations I'll work with will have that short list I was just naming, but then they'll have something about being entrepreneurial, for example, you know, mm. if that's if that's part of the DNA of that particular organization. So when I'm working with organizations, you know, one of the things I'm trying to talk to them about is, you know, let's um, allow uh, let's let's be consistent about that short list of shared values that are 
pretty much core to effective organizational functioning. But then, you know, with the giving voice to values approach, we actually ask people to think about their own particular strengths as well and their own particular comfort levels and to understand that there are many different ways to express respect. There are many different ways to enact inclusiveness. There are many different ways to um, support uh, integrity and honesty, and that people may need to do those in different ways in order for them to be both effective, but also comfortable enough to actually act on those values. So I, I work with organizations kind of at both of those levels. Can, can you tell me a little bit more about the comfort level that you talked about, um, so that an individual may have a particular comfort level with respect to a values? What, what does that mean? Yeah. So uh, this all goes back to the approach I take, the giving voice to values approach or GVV, as I call it. And it has uh, seven principles. But one of the principles is, uh, it's actually my favorite, is it, we call it self-knowledge and alignment. And the idea there is that um, although there are this, this short list of shared values where you try and find alignment between the organization and the individual and among individuals, but but then the, there are, are um, there are ways of speaking, ways of acting, ways of interacting, um, ways of building relationships that will be unique to, to me or unique to you that will be different. So, for example, if I preach to the person who's who's very assertive, very aggressive, very competitive, um, you know, very um, outgoing, that you need to be more uh, and, and and a risk taker, let's say, that you need to be more conservative. You need to be more cautious um, a, a, around some of these issues. They might say, "Well, that's fine," but that's not who I am. And if I preach to the individual who is more con conservative, more risk averse, more fearful, maybe more introverted, and say, you need to have moral courage, you need to be bold, they might say, yeah, that's great, but it's not who I am. And mm -hmm. so part of what we do with giving voice to values is that we'll present the, the values-based challenge. Um, and rather than debating what's right, you know, we'll say, okay, here is, you know, this is a post decision making scenario. We know what the right thing to do is in this situation, the thing that's consistent with our organizational values, and our personal values, and our regulatory or legal environment, all of that. But the way you're going to enact it and voice it will be different depending on who you are. And so we have examples of people who are um, going to be more comfortable asking questions, for example. We have examples of people who are more comfortable in writing. We have examples of people who are more comfortable um, going in and having a, an actual debate, um, you know, and we'll talk to people about not just looking at the issue, but looking at how you're how you've been effective in the past. What are your strengths? How are you most comfortable and therefore most likely to speak and act? And then let's create a script and an action plan that will pursue this you know, values-based position, but enact it in a way that is uh, placed to your strengths. Yeah, great. So what I'm hearing you saying is that a, a key component of organizations working with values is being very clear on the comfort level of individuals with respect to um, a particular value. Um, and then that enables them to take into consideration everybody's different comfort levels. Is, am I hearing uh, you correctly? Correctly? Not exactly. It's not so much a comfort level with the value. It's it's what their um, comfort and confidence and competence is with a way of expressing the value. Okay. So it's not you know. Okay. So yep. you know, Got it. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Comfort, confidence, competence. Comfort, confidence, competence with the with expressing the value with the way you would express the values yeah okay cool um and we'll, we'll come back in a minute because i'm really interested in the research around the impact of people having these skills that you're talking about scripting etc um but uh, i'd love to just backtrack and uh, you talked about the first principle um and you talked about that there were seven principles can you give us a fast run through those those seven principles Sure, sure. We call them the seven pillars of giving voice to values. And the first one is simply values. And it's part of what I was describing to you in your first question. It's what we're talking about when we talk about values. And we point out the fact that um, for some people, they'll say, well, you know, values are entirely 
relative. They depend on your culture, your your religious background, your his, your personal history, your family, etc. And so, therefore, you know, um, we really can't have much of this conversation. We're just all in different places, mm. and other people will be at the other end of the spectrum saying, "No, no, no." Um, you know, there is a universal set of values and I know what they are and it really doesn't matter what you think, <laughs> you know. So we have these two poles of total relativism or total absolutism. And either one of those poles makes it sort of difficult to have the kinds of conversations I'm talking about. And so what we try and point out to people is that, of course, there are differences, you know, the relativistic position. But as I said earlier, there also are a set of values that most research will suggest are pretty much universal across culture, across time. But as I said before, it's a short list and it's a very high level list. So when you're trying to talk about these things, we really should try and uh, uh, first of all, consider, is this an issue that rises to that level or is this just a matter of comfort or preference? Um, mm. um, and if it rises to the level of one of these core values, which, as I said earlier, are most likely reflected in your corporate code of ethics and value statement, then we want to address it. But then let's address it in a way that we appeal to the value that we're likely to share. Um, so try and think about as we do in GVV, we create scripts and action plans, try and think about a way to present this that is actually going to connect with the audience that you have in mind, the person you're trying to influence. So that's kind of how we talk about values. We try and get away from those twin poles that make it so you can't talk about it. The second um, pillar that we talk about is choice. And we simply that we we point out to people a lot of times, and we know from the research this is true, a lot of times people will have a values conflict and they'll feel like um, they'll, they'll act emotionally, sort of automatically. And when you ask them why, they'll say, you know, well, they'll rationalize post hoc that it was the right thing to do, or maybe that they had no choice. Um, and so one of the things we try and do with GVV is we give people exercises to help them understand the times when they have effectively acted on their values, and also the times when maybe they failed to do so, and to begin to understand the enablers and the disablers. Some of them will be universal, and some of them will be, as I said earlier, unique to me or unique to you. And so we want people to understand that there are choices the third pillar is. Can I just uh, can we just yep. grab on that because I think so we've we've, we've got to this the second one around choice, um, mm -hmm. and and what you're saying is that it's really valuable for organisations for people to understand where they've chosen to act on their values in their past. So that's a it's a very much a reflective process that you're building the muscle around people within your organisation to exercise choice around those values. Right, right. And we have exercises where we in, invite people to think about those things and to and to basically unpack them to understand right, right. what's made it easier or harder for them. Yeah, I, I, I can see value in that because it's what I understand about values. It's not a one off exercise. It's a <laughs> no. it's a continuum. It's a constant it's a, yeah. process. In Wait, fact, I tell people that the work that I'm doing is really trying to build a different kind of conversation within the organization um, mm -hmm. so that we talk about these things in a different way. So, yeah, okay, so, so it's not a one-off. Yeah, build it, building the capacity to have conversations around values. Okay, great. So yeah. number three is? Number three is purpose. And this one's fairly evident that the people who seem to be, you know, from my conversations and interviews and gathering examples throughout the development of this work, um, the people who are able to more effectively and most often, you know, voice and act on their values tend to be people who've actually reflected on their own personal and professional purpose so that they don't get caught in that trap of, you know, this quarter, <laughs> you know, mm. or this conversation, uh, but they really think about their role and their impact in a broader way. And that they also then try to appeal to that broader sense of purpose in their conversations with people that they're trying to have an influence on. And so purpose becomes important, not just in terms of my own self-motivation becomes a tool for motivating others. Um, and then the fourth one, are we up yeah, to? Can we, can we just, now? yeah, yeah, can mm -hmm. we just, um, because that, that seems like a bit of a game changer for me um, mm -hmm. in terms of values, one, two, uh, choice, and then three is purpose. And, and so you're really empowering the individual um, back to what their core purpose is so that they're very clear on that and then they can come back to that and that sort of doubles, double whammies their values when they've got the purpose happening. Yeah, yeah. Right. 
Right. Yeah. And then the fourth one I call normalization. And the idea there is that often people think of values, conflicts, ethical challenges as these kind of deer in headlight moments, you know, and that they want to just, when they, they're confronted with them, there's this anxiety, this emotional response, and there's this sort of sense of, I'm just going to get through it and get back to work. And one of the things that I was learning when I started talking to many people about the kinds of values, conflicts they encountered at work is that, um, you know, it's really a normal part of, of work. It's a normal part of life. We have values, conflicts all the time, whether it's in our organizational lives, our family lives, whatever. Um, and that when we see them as exceptional, the, mm -hmm. and, you know, these deer in headlight moments, we tend to limit our options and we do tend to react emotionally and sometimes just give in in order to get through. Um, but if you actually pause and realize that this is actually a normal part of life, it's going to happen all the time, um, you can bring the emotion down. You can also think about how can I, um, you know, develop some strategies that are going to work for me. I, I came up with this one because I was interviewing a guy who worked um in, uh, for an organization that was involved with a lot of mergers and acquisitions. And his job was usually involved with working with the CEO and CFO of the companies that they were going to acquire. Um, and he told me that he had been having a glass of wine with the CEO and CFO of one of these companies they were about to acquire. They were at the airport. They were about to fly off in different directions. <laughs> And they were very near the conclusion of the transaction. I mean, this goes on, you know, it's gone on for almost a year. There's a lot to work out. And um, the the CEO turned to, turned to him and said, um, you know, by now they were friends. You know, they'd gotten to know each other pretty well. And the CEO turned to him and said, so look, you know, tell us honestly, you know, what's going to happen to us? You know, <laughs> Is it, we're not sure we trust what's going on here. And, you know, our, are, are, are we, are we going to have, you know, um, employment and, and, and the role that we hope we will when this is over. And uh, he said, you know, he felt sort of torn. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, I lied. And then he paused and he said, instinctively, I lied, he said. But then he said, I went home and I thought about it. And I thought, if I keep doing this work and I really like this work, this question is going to come up every time, right? It's, it's always going to be in the background. And he said, so I can either just keep lying to people or he said, I can, I can, um, you know, come up with, spend a little time and come up with a, a, a sort of script, something I can say to them that is both honest and, and respectful of them, that has some significant value to them, but that doesn't violate my own, um, you know, fiduciary responsibility, you know, certain information I am not allowed to disclose. And so he said he kind of came up with this little sort of uh, a script that he could use where he would explain, you know, he, even if I knew the answer to that, I can't share it. But um, there are some things I know I can say to you that are going to be useful to you. And let me share those. And these are based on my experience of working through this kind of transaction numerous times in the past. And he said that for him, that was very useful because he felt like he was respecting the individuals that he'd built a relationship mm. with. He was giving them something of value, something of himself. Um, but he also was not lying to them or violating his obligation to his employer. And so that idea was interesting to me because he said, you know, Mary, I realize this is a normal part of doing business. And so I have a choice. I can see it as exceptional every time and be less less uh, equipped or and 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 you know basically less ethical or I can normalize it, bring the emotion down and develop an effective way of dealing. So that's it, that's normalization. Yeah. I can see the benefit here in terms of, uh, as you said, you, you're giving people a language to understand what's happening in terms of normalisation and him going through this giving voice to values gives him an opportunity to reflect back on past decisions and then be able to honestly say, yeah, there's a couple of times where it wasn't, I wasn't aligned for them and for me and then as a result of it changing his practice. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. And then okay. the, th the fifth uh, pillar, I think I already described to you, it's self-knowledge and alignment. And the idea there is that although we may be sharing the same values, the way we are going to be effective at expressing them and the way that we're more likely to express them and act on them effectively will vary depending on your own skill set, your own personality, your own style. Um, and so we actually, you know, invite people to reflect on a, a number of self-reflection questions about how they've been effective in the past, how they are most comfortable. And then also in when we share scenarios, we invite them to think about 
how would someone like you be able to do this as opposed to someone else? And we even have examples of, you know, an introvert and an extrovert dealing with similar situations. So, so that's the fifth pillar. Yeah. And the sixth. And the sixth one is voice. And the idea there is simply that there are lots of different ways to express values and, um, and you're going to be more likely to express them if you rehearse them, if you practice, if you prescript and 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 peer, work with others in peer coaching and create this kind of habit. I call it, you know, sort of a moral muscle memory um, where this becomes more natural to you. Okay. And then the seventh and last pillar is, uh, we call it reasons and rationalizations. And the idea there is that the kinds of pushback, the kinds of objections that we tend to encounter when we raise values issues in our organizational settings um, they, they're powerful, but they're not bulletproof. And there's actually a number of them that are fairly predictable um, and that we can think about them in advance and begin to unpack them. So we identified, you know, the four kinds of uh, uh, pushback or rationalizations and reasons that we hear most frequently in business. And, we, and we've started to invite people to think about different ways to respond when you hear those particular objections, whether it's, oh, it's standard operating procedure, or it's not material, or it's above my pay grade, um, or um, sure, it may be wrong, but I feel loyalty to my company or my my boss or my customer or my colleague. So we those are the four that we hear most frequently, and we invite people to actually think about them in advance so that they're more comfortable in finding ways to reframe them and address them. Right, great, thank you. And I, I think that those those seven principles will be really useful for for people, and we'll, we'll uh, give people some in the show notes some more information about those seven principles and where they can read more about giving voice to values. I, I know, you know, you, you wrote this program in, in 2010, but you've been working with values for a long time. What have you seen shift in the way organisations work with values um, from then up until now? What have been the key shifts? Yeah. So when I first started doing this work, um, you know, there was pretty much an exclusive emphasis on what I call awareness and analysis, you know, basically sharing lots of examples of the kinds of values conflicts you might encounter in, in your industry or in the region of the world where you were operating or in the, the functional area where you were working. Um, and then so building awareness so you'll recognize those issues when you encounter them. And then the second thing is teaching analysis is how I put it, you know, but it was the idea that we're going to share with you the relevant um corporate codes of conduct, the relevant regulations where you're operating, the relevant laws, um, so that you can, when you recognize this issue, then you'll be able to think about those standards, those guidelines, and decide, is this over the line or not? So it was pretty much a, an intellectual or cognitive approach. And um, what I was trying to do is saying, those are important, you know, don't throw those out, but that you need to add the third A, which I call action, which is then to actually invite people into this process of prescripting and action planning and rehearsing and peer coaching to build that muscle memory. And so that was sort of the kind of big shift that I was seeing when I first started doing this work. And, and you know, it was typically people from the ethics or compliance area who would be inviting me in to speak to their organization. As time passed, um, we started also being invited in by from people who are working around leadership development in the organizations because they began to realize that the same skills that we were talking about and the same habits were really leadership habits, even if it wasn't an ethical issue. Often leadership is about communicating difficult messages. And so people were finding that that was a useful skill building approach. But then more recently, um, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on um, research in the field of behavioral ethics, behavioral economics, cognitive neurosciences, and a lot of that work is starting to come into organizational training and, and efforts. And so we've spent a lot of time showing how the giving voice to values approach is actually informed by and actually was informed by a lot of the research in those areas and is consistent with it. Um, and so those are some of the kinds of shifts that we've been seeing. So I'm interested in, in what proportion of organizations from your experience have a giving at this type of attention. 
um, because this muscle building process does take time and does take resources and does you can become distracted by the the, the day-to-day operations and vision of the organization and growth and stuff like that. What, what are the challenges that organizations have in in um, taking this particular type of approach which inquires, requires a lot of muscle um, building around building the values muscle. Well, it's interesting. The the organizations that I've been working with, you're right, it's not a one and done kind of thing, but actually um, any kind of compliance or ethics training typically isn't a one and done kind of thing anyways, you know, partly because issues change and the challenges that an organization changes. And so this isn't really so much a matter of adding more time or adding more resources. It's more about what you do with that time, you know, and yeah. how you spend it. So for example, the first corporation that I worked with on uh, to use GVV and and who still uses it today is Lockheed Martin, the aviation um, and defense industry uh, corporation. And they already had an award-winning approach to compliance and ethics training that they were very wedded to where they would identify the salient issues in a particular year and they would create these uh, video enactments of various kinds of challenges. And it was really raising what I talked about earlier, helping people raise awareness and helping them to analyze what's the right thing to do. But they were worried that this was staying at that cognitive level and not really getting into people's behavior. And so they reached out to me and said, you know, we're interested, we're intrigued in this focus on action. And so I've been working with them, I guess it's at this point, I think it's probably been 10 years or so, where they still use their video approach. They're very wedded to that and they do it very well. And they still identify, you know, those issues that are evergreen as well as those issues that are new because technology changes or, you know, the global context, especially for a defense contractor changes. But they've started to develop their, um, design their videos differently so that it actually gives people a chance to, think about how to talk about the issue rather than just simply identifying it and deciding, oh, yeah, this violates our our code of conduct. They actually have, you know, um, bifurcated videos where the the characters will start to raise an issue and maybe they do it ineffectively at first and then they come back and rethink it and then they um, will find better ways to raise it and the and the learners will have an opportunity to um, think about what didn't work and what does work and to begin to discuss and practice that. So they're not spending any more time than they used to spend on their training. They've just structured it differently so that now the discussion is about, well, so how do you raise it when you're actually feeling pressured by your manager to, um, you know, communicate that the, uh, to shortchange an RFP or to suggest it won't be as lengthy a process or as costly a process as as you know, it will be. How do you raise that in a way that's going to be persuasive? So, um, so that's you know, I, I've found that there's uh, been a lot of receptivity to that, and then also there's a lot of receptivity to the idea that, as I said earlier, this is really about building better communication throughout the organization in general, um, and so people feel like they're getting more value. So rather than it's just, okay, time out for ethics, it's really about interact organizational interactions and Mm. having them more effective. Okay. Yeah. Good. Great. And so, so say for example, I'm a a CEO founder of an organization that's got about 40 employees or, you know, not, not too many. Um, My resources are, are less. What, what can I do? I don't have an ethics training program. How can I um, bring this into conversations, bring this into our project planning, bring this into our strategic planning, bring this into our weekly meetings? How, what, what can I do? I, you know, a small number of people, small number of resources. How can I bring this to action? Right. So we've worked with smaller organizations as well. And I think there's kind of two directions you can go in. I mean, there are resources that we've made available that people can use. Uh, there's there's a MOOC through Coursera, for example. There's mm. a series of interactive online modules through um, a, an organization called Nomadic. And so some of the more small and mid-sized organizations I've worked with have used those resources because they don't really have an in-house training program or mm. something like that. 
But the other the other thing is simply that, as I said, there's just there's a few little tips in terms of how you frame conversations and discussions. And so sometimes with smaller organizations, I'll simply come in and speak with them, you know, and maybe talk with a group of, of managers. I'm going to be doing that with a, an organization in a few weeks at for NASA, you know, where we will talk with managers about ways that they can change the conversation with their teams um, so that these kinds of um, discussions can be more effective. So it doesn't always have to be a big, fancy, <laughs> lots of yeah, ribbons yeah. and bows kind of training program. It really is, as I said earlier, about changing the conversation, asking different questions. And, you know, instead of only asking, you know, can we do this? The action, the question is more about how can we do this and stay within our guidelines and our code of conduct so that you're shifting that conversation with your teams? And we've also designed exercises where people at different levels will look at the same scenario. I did this with Unilever in Nigeria, where we had the same scenario um, and ethical conflicts that, that, that they had identified as pretty relevant for them. And we put all the middle managers together in small groups to talk about, you know, how could I raise this issue with my boss who's telling me to do this and I, I know we shouldn't be doing it. And how can I raise it in a way that I'll be effective and persuasive and won't hurt myself? Um, and then we put the senior managers in different groups, gave them the same scenario and said, how could one of your uh, team members bring this to you in a way that would make it easier for you to hear what he or she had to say? <laughs> what would make this, you know, more persuasive to you? So we didn't cast them as villains. We asked them, you know, how would you like people to raise these issues with you? So then when they came back to have a debrief, they started, you know, engaging in this natural social contracting, you know, where the middle managers would say, well, if you would behave in this way, and the senior managers were saying, well, if you would behave in this way, way and and they they kind of created this sort of agreement about you know what I will do and what you will do that would make it easier right. for them and, and these conversational tips that and I'd like to is see if we can get a, a few examples and uh, what I was getting a sense from you is that the the general rule with these uh, these questions is that they should be open-ended as opposed to close-ended can we uh, should we um, but it's more open-ended. Can you give us an example of a conversational tip to that people could use um, in their everyday team conversations? Yeah, so um, the open-ended, closed-ended, I just want to make sure that that I've been clear. Our, our scenarios, our situations are not open-ended in the sense of what's the right thing to do. They mm. are, as, as I said earlier, they are in fact post-decision-making. They mm. could end with a protagonist who has decided what he or she thinks the right thing to do is. The question is, how could they get it done effectively? What would they need to say? To whom? In what mm. sequence? And what would the pushback be? And so that's how we change the conversation. It's not... Um, it, it, it's really about how do you express it, as I said earlier, or how mm. do you communicate it in a way that it's more likely to be heard. Um, I can give you an example um, just because it's it's short because <laughs> we have many of these. And when we work with companies, we usually try and have them identify scenarios that are relevant to their industry or what they do or where they operate. But um, we also have hundreds of pieces of material that we've developed um, that people can, you know, try out if they're relevant to them. And and so one example I, I, I often use just because it's easy to tell the story quickly, and it's a real story, is a, as a woman who uh, went to work for um, a financial services firm, actually a firm that managed the portfolios of high net worth individuals, very wealthy individuals. And she was new in the company. And her boss was also relatively new in the company. And he called her into his office um, one morning and said, I have a meeting this afternoon with one of our clients. Um, this client is one of our smaller clients, you know, not, not as high net worth as, as our typical client, but we, we service his portfolio because he's a good friend of one of the major, one of the partners in the firm. And his, this, this gentleman is an elderly gentleman. His portfolio had significantly under, underperformed the benchmarks that their firm had actually set in the past period. And so her boss was telling her, I want you to create a, a slide deck and a set of talking points 
that will make it look like his portfolio did better um, and, and that it wasn't so out of alignment with, with uh, benchmarks um, because this is a fairly unsophisticated investor. It's an elderly gentleman. This is his, you know, what he hoped, his legacy money he hopes to leave for his grandkids. He won't know the difference. Um, so, you know, this woman was feeling like, geez, you know, I don't really want to lie to this, to this man, you know, this doesn't feel right. Um, but on the other hand, she, her boss was saying, I need this this afternoon, it's very short, you know, and she didn't really have a long term relationship with her boss yet. And so she was feeling really pressured. Um, and so the way we would end that scenario is we would say not what should she do? Like, should she give in this time and figure I'll work over time or, you know, instead it was just, she knows she doesn't want to do this. Um, how can she be effective? And so people are supposed to think about what might they say and do that could be effective in this scenario. Mm -hmm. And then we have a set of questions, a protocol that people work through where we ask them to identify what the values-based position is, what's at stake. We ask them to think about what's at risk for all the affected parties. In other words, what's motivating her boss? Why is he worried about this? And what's at risk for the investor and for the partner, et cetera. And then we ask them to identify what are the reasons and rationalizations that she's likely to face, the kinds of pushback or objections if she raises this. And then finally, given all that information, what is going to be her most effective action plan and script? So we work them through and people will come up with lots of different strategies. And it's interesting, we get very different kinds of strategies when we're working with uh, legal professionals versus lower level managers versus compliance people versus more senior managers. But, um, and then we share what actually happened. And in this case, what she did is she, she you know, realized that if she just said no, it wouldn't it would not help her relationship with her boss, but it also probably wouldn't help this investor because her boss would probably just go ask another associate to do to do the 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 plan, you know, and so she would just be passing the problem on to someone else. So that didn't seem like a solution. So what she did is she went to her boss and and she said, um, I don't really have time, you know, and usually people will use time as a reason for giving in to the ethical conflict. I don't have enough time to come up with a creative solution, right? But she used it in reverse. She said, I don't have time to come up with a convincing alternate set of slides and benchmarks and talking points for you for your meeting this afternoon. But what I do have time for and what I have done is I've created a, a set of slides uh, with talking points that point out exactly where we went off track and why and what we're going to do next period to address that. And so she created a script for him. And her boss wasn't thrilled, but he accepted it. And, you know, the investor wasn't thrilled, but he accepted it. But, you know, I think what she recognized or what the approach she took was she decided, I'm going to assume that my boss is not invested in being unethical. I'm going to assume that his problem is that he's invested in getting through a difficult conversation that afternoon. So mm -hmm. I'm going to solve his problem but in a different way than the way he asked. So she gave him a script. She gave him uh, data. She gave him um, solutions to offer to this investor. And she made it easier for him to have this conversation. So she presented herself not as someone who is his enemy or antagonist. She presented him as she presented herself as someone who wanted to help him, um, but was helping him in a different way. Now, when I share this with people, some people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Other people will say, but she didn't tell him it was unethical. And, I, you know, I don't know, but I think what she would say is that her boss, you know, knew why she didn't want to do what he asked her to do. Um, but she allowed him to save face. She uh, presented mm -hmm. herself as on his side and, and, and in that way sort of was able to build a better relationship with him going forward, but also was communicating that this is not the way she wants to operate. And so that's just one example. We've mm. got many examples, but, you know, different ways that people can begin to raise these issues. So what, what I'm getting from that is that the power is in the unpacking. And as you said, you're, you're giving the scenario, then they have to do that post and then they come back and are given the actual what the person actually did, and then they've given an opportunity to discuss and reflect on that as well. Um, and and I, what it, what that's all about is building the muscle. And my big takeaway, absolutely, my big takeaway from from this is that any organisation working with values, it's dynamic, it's complex, 
um, and that it is a, a constant process of developing the muscle. Yes, although what you also what I also tend to see is that people start doing this and they start to realize there are more ways to respond to these situations. Mm. They get more comfortable with it. And it's not like they're starting from zero every time. So for example, I've been working for the last couple of years with KPMG and, um, you know, initially we just developed some training for everybody, for all the U S employees. It's like 33,000 people or something. Um, you know, it was, was web-based training because it was during COVID where we presented GVV and we gave them some exercises, some of the kinds of things I've already described but then as they realized this was sort of catching on, they decided to create, um, they called it the GVV or the KPMG GVV Master Facilitators Program, where they brought in partners and senior managers on a voluntary basis. And we ran several cohorts of them um, where we gave them more time working with these issues and working with GVV. And we also worked with them to identify scenarios that came up in their work. So if they worked in audit or they worked in tax or they worked in business practices group or consulting, they were identifying scenarios that happened to them or to their colleagues. And we turned them into giving voice to value style post decision making scenarios. And then we worked together to create approaches to them. And then we gave them the chance to teach their scenarios to each other. So that they were building the they were building a library of resources for the organization. They were building the capacity for themselves to be able to voice and manage voice more effectively. But they were also now um, will be called on to uh, sort of parachute into various training programs to offer a GVV style discussion in a tax training program or in an audit program or or uh, consulting or whatever it is. So you know that that approach meant that they were reaping more benefits than just a single training program you know yeah and, and so I think there's a couple of components to that in terms of there's the knowledge management uh, component so that you've you you're just not stopping with one scenario the more you do it the more scenarios or stories or dilemmas that you pick up from the organization and turn those into scenarios um, and the other thing is is giving leaders the capacity, training them to facilitate these types of conversations. And the more conversations they facilitate, I would imagine, they, they be, their own muscle uh, gets developed and refined. Exactly. So it's not just developing trainers, it's developing people who will interact with their employees and their teams and their colleagues in this way in the regular course of business. Yeah, great. So coming back to the, the point that I mentioned that I've come to is about the impact of um, these giving voice to values programs. And you said, you know, over 1400 um, business schools um, ac across the world uh, have adopted this. And then it's, numerous... it's not all business schools, it's business schools, companies, nonprofits, okay. various types of organizations. So, so how do you measure the uh, the impact of this? How does an organization know that What's the bottom line with respect to having done all of this work? What's what's the evidence show? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So I tend to answer that question at, at four levels. So the first mm. level is GVV was actually based on empirical research, not research on GVV because GVV didn't exist, but I was reading research from those scholars who were doing empirical research in psychology and behavioral ethics who were identifying how people actually deal with ethical issues and were identifying the fact that they, rather than having an ethical issue and sitting down and doing a pro and con list or thinking about, you know, what would this philosopher say that typically people react much more automatically, emotionally, even unconsciously, and then rationalize after the fact why it was okay. Um, and so understanding that made me realize that we needed to design some to be effective, to have an impact. We needed to design something that wasn't just about this sort of um, ethical pro and con or this analytical process or this totally cognitive process, we needed to literally rewire that automatic response. And the way to rewire that, I also was looking at the research on habit formation, for example, on positive deviance, for example, um, uh, uh, neuroscience research around creating new neural pathways. And the whole idea was we have to actually invite people to practice doing this. And so that's the first level of, in terms of 
um, understanding that this can have an impact is that it was based on empirical research about those different procedures. And then the second level is people just started to experiment with it um, and they you know, um, started to gather, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, anecdotal uh, stories. And so we started to hear from people who, you know, said, oh, well, we did this training and and then, you know, this, look what happened with my employee, you know, they raised this issue, they had to go through six different conversations, but they didn't let it go. And then when they were asked why they did that, they said, well, I was giving voice to values, you know, we got stories like that. Okay, so that was the second level. And then the third level is people started to do sort of pre post kind of surveying. Um, a lot of this has been done actually by academics in accounting, where they will run accounting um, uh, courses based on a GVV uh, model and will do pre and post surveys with their students. And they see that there's a positive impact in terms of confidence and, and, and um, you know, their expressed likelihood of voicing and acting on their values. But then the fourth level and the kind of holy grail would be to, you know, do a training and then two years later, someone has an ethical conflict and they do the right thing. And it's because they had that training. Now, I'm not trained as a social scientist, but I've worked with social scientists who, you know, about looking at how could we do that. And it's very hard to design that model because there's so much noise in the system. So it would be, you might be able to have a correlative connection, but it's very hard to prove a causal connection because of all the other noise in the system between the time you do the training and the time after. That said, organizations that I've worked with have you know, been gathering data and gathering responses and the feedback they give me, and of course their data is proprietary, so I can't publish it. They don't share it with me in that form, but they, uh, the feedback they give me is that they actually do see that people raise issues more often or feel more confident about raising issues. Or um, in fact, at, at Lockheed, they told me that they were hearing from people that when they encountered some of these kinds of issues, they were more likely to go to the ethics officers, but not to simply report an issue, but actually to say, I want to deal with this issue myself, but will you work with me to come up with an effective script and action plan to do it? Which from their perspective, that's more true culture change. So that, you know, GVV is not about whistleblowing. It's not about reporting. It's about actually changing the conversation on the ground and the relationships on the ground within the organization so that you don't just assume <laughs> that someone is irredeemable <laughs> you know, that you're actually trying to change the way the organization operates. And so we started to get that kind of feedback. KPMG, for example, has been gathering data since I've been working with them for the last two years. And I'm actually talking to them now about, is there a way that we can publish some of this? You know, So I'm hoping that we can because they feel like they've seen a positive impact. Um, so um yeah, great. And, and, and I think, you know, it, it is um, in people's minds with respect to energies and resources that they put into these activities to raise the the, the frequency around, around values and, and then being able to say, well, this is the impact on my organisation. And what I hear you say, it's going to be different for different organisations and they'll have to come up with their own set of measures of, of how to look at the impact of values um, conversations and developing that values muscle. Although what's interesting is that often with ethics, ethics training and actually kind of a lot of leadership training, you know, the kinds of assessments that they do are, you know, after a training sort of getting feedback on, did you like it? Was it useful? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, organizations I've worked with do that. Um, but but I think what's been more powerful to me is when organizations collect stories of people who've actually done things and attribute it to this experience. And and that's what I'm really uh, more interested in being able to report. Yeah, yeah. And then that comes back to that knowledge management component of, of this exercise mm -hmm. is, is collecting the stories, having a library of stories. Um, it's been a fantastic com conversation, Mary, and I think that there's lots of take-homes for people on a real practical level. Um, the seven principles, uh, the different ways of tweaking, you know, how to have conversations about this in organisations. What's one take-home that you would leave somebody that's sort of maybe not starting from ground zero, but they're just starting to think about the value of having these types of conversations, what would be one piece of advice you would have for that person? 
Yeah, I, I actually would invite people to to do personally one of the exercises that we do in the training. We call it a tale of two stories, where we actually ask people to think about a time when they encountered a significant values conflict and they were effective at, at acting in, on their values. And then to think about a time when they had that kind of a conflict and they were less effective or not effective and to try and begin to understand, you know, what are, what were the enablers and what were the disablers? And I think when people start doing that for themselves, they also can begin to see that when you have those situations where you didn't voice your values effectively, a lot of times if you can frame the challenge in a way that's going to play to your strengths, it's going to maximize the enablers, it's going to neutralize the disablers, you're going to be more likely to act. Because so often when we don't act on our values, it's because we've we've told ourselves we don't have those choices. Um, I always tell people, if you don't remember anything else from my talks, I hope that you'll you'll begin to believe that you may have more choices than you think you do. <laughs> Lovely, lovely. A tale of two stories, enablers and disablers. Thank you. That's I think will be very useful for people. Thanks, Mary. Uh, it's been fantastic having a conversation with you. And and look, it's probably about the fourth conversation we've had together. And I find that each and every time I think I know about giving voice to values. <laughs> um, and then I get an understanding. Well, no, not quite. You still don't fully understand it. So thank you very much for taking out the time um, thank, uh, thank today you, and uh, giving us some fantastic insights to giving voice to values. Thank you, Stephen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Owl Insights, Working with Values. Please do subscribe to our Owl newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. More information about today's speaker can be found in the show notes.